Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Enhance Your Emotional Intelligence, which is part of our Get That Job webinar series here at the Champaign Public Library. My name is Jordan Neal, and I am the career librarian here. So thank you all for joining us. Let's see here. So for the latest library news and updates, we invite you to visit our website, champagne.org. Um, or you could, of course, chat with us just by visiting the homepage of our website. Um, the library is open, um, but we are also offering curbside services. Um, so that could be an option for you as well. Uh, moving on to a couple of Zoom features available to you that might help during this webinar. There are some buttons or icons at the bottom of your Zoom screen, depending on your device. On the far left, you have the options that control your sound or your speaker. Um, moving to the right and within the center of the window includes a chat and raised hand option. You can use these options to ask us questions or share any comments. I'm sure our presenter will be um, okay with pausing for questions. Um, we invite you to type your, your question to the chat or raise your hand and we can unmute you if you prefer to speak and ask your questions. And I would like to also remind everyone that our webinars are recorded. Finally, I would like to introduce our presenter, Janice All, with All About You. Um, I invite you to read Janice's entire bio on our website, but um, with 30 years of experience in the corporate environment, Janice has a passion for coaching people, especially, um, especially on how they can develop their emotional intelligence skills, as she has graciously done for us um, in a previous webinar. We're so glad that she's joined us today. So with that, Janice, I will turn it over to you. Excellent. Thank you, Jordan. It's so wonderful to be here and to work with you again, uh, and also with the patrons of the Champaign uh, Public Library. So I love our libraries. It's an excellent resource. So hopefully all of you online are taking advantage of, of this great tool and resource that you have available to you because it's just a wealth of information, especially the curbside service is really nice. So we appreciate that. I'm going to put it, ask you to step back and just pause for a second and think back to when you had to get out of your comfort zone. So maybe it was something happened and you were forced to get out of your comfort zone and try something new. Maybe you you know, made the decision of, I'm going to go do this. And you finally made the decision and you stepped out of your comfort zone. So think back to a time when you stepped out of your comfort zone, did something different, something new, took on a responsibility, new experience. Um, what did you do? So what, what did you do? But most importantly, what did you learn from that experience? So think back to when you stepped out of your comfort zone and what did you learn from that experience? And while we're waiting, and so in the chat box, so if you look at chat, you'll see where it says chat. And then you could go ahead and uh, hit, click on chat, and send it to all participants, and then go ahead and hit send. And then I will go ahead and be able to see uh, if you, I prefer you send to all participants, but otherwise you send it to me and I could go ahead and, re and read to see what you have. Um, I know for me, I've had both were choice comfort zones and forced comfort zones. I will say that when I was forced to get out of my comfort zone, it was very scary. Um, but then after it was over with, I stepped back and went, it wasn't as bad that I thought as I thought. Um, and I actually learned something. It was a positive experience. Um, but at first, when I was pushed into it, it was really scary. Uh, for other people, it, they went in with both like, hey, this is something I've been wanting to try, wanting to do, try some public speaking and let me get out there and try it. I'm sure that the person was very nervous when they first had to do it. But then there again, once you do it, it's like, oh, it wasn't that bad. I'm um, an, an opportunity to learn. Excellent. Um, and then also think about that comfort zone. Like, for some people, like they'll go skydive with no problem, where some people are like, yeah, I need to think about it for a while and I need some encouragement. And there is no right or wrong answer. But the whole reason why we're doing this is to stop and think, what, what's that comfort zone for you? What are you comfortable with? And then what's comfortable for you to step out of that comfort zone? And like I said, some people are comfortable just taking huge steps of like, I've never done public speaking before, but let me go and jump in front of 100 people and, and speak, where other people are like, no, 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 let me start with a small group first, and then I'll go from there. Neither one's right or wrong, it's just knowing who you are, what you prefer, but the key is to constantly push yourself to get out of your comfort zone and try something new, because it's going to, it's healthy for you in so many ways, and we'll talk about that in today's workshop. So in what we're going to talk about today is like, what are those components to emotional intelligence? What are they? 
And then what are some strategies that you could take to develop your emotional intelligence skills? So you'll see it as EI or, or EQ. Um, I prefer to use the EI. The good news is emotional intelligence is a skill that can be developed. And a lot of times we're developing it and we don't even know it. And as I go through some of the things that we talk about tonight, you'll go, oh yeah, I've been doing that. Then you could say, hey, I've been developing my emotional intelligence. So that's the, so what this will hopefully do, give you some language and some really targeted things that there again, you could take that time to reflect and say, I wanna work on this. Um, to really start building. So we're gonna look at, you know, do I have a self, an accurate self-assessment of my strengths and um, weaknesses? Do I have the confidence to, when I, if I do go to a job interview, I have the confidence to say, these are my strengths and here, here's my opportunities for development or here's what I'd like to learn. Um, and then what's that inner dialogue that you're having with yourself? So are you giving yourself courage or you, you have that, what we call the gremlin that's saying, oh, why are you doing that? That's not good. You know, how can we tame that gremlin? We'll talk about that. And then just being tuned into other people's thought, uh, feelings and, and being able to pick up where they're coming from or maybe if they have questions, but being able to pick that up and then respond to that and flexing the way you're showing up to build relationships and to influence people when you want them to do something like hire you. So yes, this is who I am, um, more information on LinkedIn, uh, but for, the, for what I really want to say is on this slide is I always focus on the people side of the business because for me, it's I find passion in helping people identify where am I at either as a leader, an individual or a team, where am I at and what can I do to make myself better or to make the team better? And uh, that's, that's what I've been all about and that's what I really enjoy doing. So what is, what is and how do you see a growth mindset? What does a growth mindset look like? So in the chat box and to all participants, so if someone says you have a growth mindset, what does that mean? Um, and what does it look like? So you go ahead in the chat box and to all participants, what does a growth mindset look like? And, and how, how do you know it? What do, what's a person saying? What's a person doing when they're in that growth mindset? So they're asking a lot of why questions, yes. Um, they, they come in with, let's give it a try. We've never done it that way before. Yeah, so they're, they're willing, they're open to feedback, wanting to hear and learn more. Yes, um, they're not afraid to get out of their comfort zone. So that's that growth mindset, yes. And, they, and like I said, they look at things as opportunities with the glasses half full, the, you know, let's give it a try versus we've always done it that way. That will never work. That is not a growth mindset. And on the slide, you'll see the components inside here, what a growth mindset looks like. It's that they're, they're willing to challenge themselves and challenge others. Um, and they encourage other people like, let's give it a try. Let's, let's see how this works. Or they'll get out of their comfort zone. So they might apply for a position that they thought, well, I have the majority of the skills of what this job is looking for, but I'm not sure if I have everything, but let's apply. Let me you know, put my resume in and let's see what happens. Right? So they're willing to, to give it a try. And then when they do go for the interview, if they do talk to someone, they learn from that experience and they take that experience and learn to grow from it. So that's the mindset that we want to be in because that fixed mindset, what you see on the screen, it, it sets the person up for failure. Failure. Um, they aren't willing to learn something new and not willing to get out of their comfort zone. Um, and people just don't want to hang out with people that are like, we've always done it this way. That will never work. What are we doing that for? Um, and, and they're not willing to try. And that's not going to help anyone be successful. So I encourage you to really you know, help get in that, just give things a try, get in that growth mindset. So in order to do that, there's a some key areas to focus on. So it's that resiliency. So uh, you'll see here phrases like fail forward. Um, if you fall down, just get up, you know, brush your knees off and keep moving forward. So it's having that resiliency. It's recovering. If you have a setback to say, oh, that didn't work, but what can I learn from it and how can I move on? So it's having that, that resiliency. It's also that, that per, uh, being persistent, having that, uh, the, the, uh, that steadfast of staying with something. So you know, you've, you know, oh my gosh, I've sent out five inter just five resumes this week. Great. Send out five more, right? Or do the follow-up letter or, you know, just keep trying it. Try a different way. Talk to someone. Find a mentor. But you just keep at it and don't give up. So being persistent of just, let me just persevere and just get, work through this and find a way to, to get through this challenge that I'm facing and, and reach out for help and be willing to ask people, can you help me? What can I learn from this? Or can you give me some expert advice? And then that having that agility of 
being able to change when needed. So if your job role changes, like they make an announcement, you know, you were doing this job, but now tomorrow you're doing that job. It's going, okay, it's a new experience. I've never done that before, but let me see what it's like. Um, or even better yet, knowing that it's coming down the road. So, you know, people that have that high emotional intelligence, they're almost able to predict the future because they'll see what's happening. And they'll see that, hey, you know what? There's been some announcements that's come through. I noticed that they're doing this. I've noticed that. I wonder if I need to start developing this skill. So if the organization makes this announcement, I'm ready because I've already started developing that skill. So um, people that high emotional intelligence keep that radar. They have a strong network and they talk and they listen and they just review and they just are able to pick up that, you know what? Change is on the horizon. And am I ready for that? So especially like, for instance, you know, go back to the pandemic, we all had to start working from home. The, you know, folks, the virtual world, working virtually, um, doing Zoom meetings, you know, webinars, those things were picking up before the pandemic hit. And so the people that realized, wow, this technology stuff is really going to the next level. I need to learn how to do these Zoom meetings. Or I need to learn how to, you know, work, do this virtual stuff. And they, people started to learn that. So then when the pandemic hit, they had already developed that skill versus those folks that were in that fixed mindset. They were like, what? We got to work remotely? How are we going to do that? Um, so it's like being able to predict that future. And the re and being having these skills, that resiliency, the perseverance, and the agility, um, it it takes a different mindset, and it's also understanding that our brain will play games with us. So the get into the science of the brain, which um, for my analytical folks, you're going to really love this. And I encourage you to continue to look for more information. Um, but we are um, our reptilian or the amygdala part of our brain is constantly scanning the horizon so it's and that's the primitive part that's always like danger danger it's always on the lookout of what's happening my parents out there you know you're constantly like you are watching your kids out of the corner of your eye and then you respond before you even know what happened right so they they go to touch something hot and you reach out and grab them pull them back before you even thought about it because that's that that amygdala part of your brain and it's it picks up that there's danger and then you quickly assign an emotion or a feeling that's the limbic part of your brain if that's danger they're going to get hurt and you respond from that and you quickly grab them and pull them away and that you save that child right you save them from getting burnt um, and that's where a lot of times we just spend the majority of our time in that autopilot where we're just constantly going through um, scanning the horizon we're dealing with things something happens we quickly assign an emotion or feeling to it and many times we, we respond from that part of the brain well what happens unfortunately is we end up sometimes putting judgments or feelings or emotions to it that might not be based on facts or data so if we're working with a coworker, oh here they come again they're always doing xyz and we have our biases or our judgments kick in and we'll respond with that without getting into that, the, the neocortex or the thinking part of our brain. So research shows it takes six seconds to get from your reptilian side of your brain, it takes six seconds to get to that thinking part of the brain. So what we encourage you to do is, you know, when that coworker comes up to your desk and you're like, oh, here they go again, pause, take a breath, and then really listen, get out of autopilot and really listen to get into that thinking part of the brain. Because that's the part of the brain where you're gonna uh, be able to make the, the sound decisions. You're gonna be looking at the facts and the data um, and you're not gonna be making decisions based on the emotional part of your brain. Uh, so if you're in a job interview and they ask you a question, that's a really tough question. Instead of letting your nerves take over, which is like, oh my God, I never, I didn't think about that question. And then you start getting nervous and, th and then you start talking fast or, stumbling over your words, just pause. You know what? That's a really great question. And then taking that six seconds is going to get you out of that think the, the emotional part of your brain is going to get you into the thinking part of your brain and you'll be able to come up with a good answer. So that's why it's good to just take time to pause and get into that thinking part of the brain. And if you do get into that, something chaotic happens where the adrenaline kicks in, you know how we get to the, the you know, stress happens, something happens, we get, you know, had a slam on our brakes. It takes your brain like 15 to 20 minutes to, to recover from that, um, from those, those um, events that just kick up the, the adrenaline really fast. So it's important to be able to, to, the deep breathing helps get you 
get your body calm and calm down. Um, and then, like I said, it's, it's making sure that we're not making decisions based on the emotional part of our brain. The whole science behind this is just so interesting. And the reason why I cover this is because it's so important to know how am I showing up on a day-to-day -day basis? Like, do I know what triggers I have? Like, if I don't get enough sleep, you know, uh, how do I respond? If I get, uh, if I'm hungry, um, is there, uh, you know, a certain time of day or someone sends me an email or a phrase, some, you know, someone says this phrase and it tends to, you know, I tend to get upset with that. So is that having that self-awareness of what are my strengths, what are my limitations, and what are those triggers? Are there triggers that, that throw me off? And then once you make that self-awareness, awareness and you know it, then you could do that self-management. You know what? If I don't eat first thing in the morning, I tend to get cranky. So I, I, make, I have to make sure I have a good breakfast. Or if I eat too much sugar, I tend to get too jittery and, and I talk too fast. So it's just knowing that having that self-awareness and that will help with that self-management. So it's the intrapersonal side of it. And then, and then also being able to label your emotions. So what's interesting is this is from Susan, um, Susan David, Emotional Agility. Uh, her research shows that we say an average of 16,000 words a day. So we say an average of 16,000 words a day. That doesn't include our thoughts. And if you're like me, your mind is like constantly going. The key is do we really you know, know and accept that I'm going to have positive thoughts, I'm going to have negative thoughts, it's, you know, my emotions are going to be all over the board and they could change at any moment, but to be attuned to that, right, to be attuned like, oh, you know what, I haven't, um, I'm really anxious right now, and to be able to assign that, that word to it, that's why I love this wheel, because you, are you really mad or are you just hurt or are you jealous, right, so, and so it's that have, creating that self-awareness of, you know, I really feel, um, I really feel sad. Well, am I, is it really sad or am I really, am I feeling inadequate? Because someone asked me to do something that I'm not positive I know how to do and I need to maybe let people know that this is a new experience for me. I've never done that before. So it's learning to understand your emotions and identify what is that true emotion um, and then accept it and use it to, in, in a way to learn, grow, or to, in a positive way, and move on and understand that you will experience a wide range of emotions throughout the day. And most importantly, emotions are contagious. So stop to think about this. Um, have you been around where, you know, yeah, you walk in a room and everyone's laughing and everyone's smiling. And you, when you walked in, you weren't feeling really good. Like maybe you just got some bad news or you were a little cranky or, you know, the kids did something and you're just sort of angry. But then you get around this group of people that are laughing, they're, they're joking around, they're smiling. And before you know it, you're feeling that exact same emotion. Um, emotions are contagious. There's actually research out there where they hook people up and they, it shows how emotions are contagious. So know how you're showing up. So if you are in a group of people, you don't want to be the person that's bringing everybody down um, unless, you know, you have to, like maybe it's a serious thing, like, oh my gosh, the project's late and, you know, the customer's upset. We got to get us out the door. Are you, are you using the appropriate motion emotion to get people engaged, to get people motivated. Um, but it's knowing that and then leveraging that and knowing that they are contagious. So, so you have that intrapersonal piece that, that um, understanding yourself, how you're your self-awareness and that self-management piece. And then the other components to emotional intelligence is that social awareness and relationship management. That social awareness is being able to understand where the other person's coming from, their perspective. You're reading between the lines. Like they might be saying the words that this is, you know, this is what's happening. This is, you know, what's going on, but you're picking up cues that there might be something more than what you're really, than what they're really saying. So you're going to go, well, really? Because it seems like you might have a question and it looks like you might, you might want more information. Am I misinterpreting that? So that's that social awareness piece. Um, and, and, and knowing what's needed from you at the time. Like there's some people that just know when they walk into a room, they know what to, to say or do to help influence people or to help people make, you know, feel calm. Like if they're working with someone who's really anxious about something, they know just what to say or the tone of voice or what to do to help calm that person down. That's that social awareness piece. And the relationship management piece is giving that person what they need. Uh, do they, you know, do they need encouragement? Do they need someone uh, to to uh, 
help guide them answer questions, but that's building that relationship. And um, so this is all from Daniel Goleman. So uh, you'll see on the slide, Daniel Goleman is one of my favorite authors to read about. He takes the research that scientists have used and then he writes it in great format for people like me so I could understand it. He has videos, he has books, he has, you know, go to YouTube. And then there's a great website called Key Step Media. Um, and he and Richard by Boreatis uh, have a lot of papers and a lot of research that they that they publish. So anything from Daniel Goldman I highly recommend. And then he will have other people to to recommend as well. And when we communicate with people, and I've read I I hinted to this is it's listening with your senses. So on this slide, it shows that when people communicate, 55% of the message is through their nonverbal skills, their facial expressions, their eye contact, their gestures. And then the tone of voice is 38% and 7% is the word. Now, this is if you're communicating with people virtually with camera or face to face. And for my parents out there, you are very good with the look, right? I mean, you think about it, or your parents, like they would just look at you and you would know that you did something that you're not supposed to be doing. That's that nonverbal, being able to communicate with the nonverbal. Or they would use their tone of voice where they would just say your name with a certain tone of voice and you immediately knew, oops, yeah, I overstepped. And so it's to think about this as you're communicating with people, what's your tone of voice? What's that nonverbal? So and it's hard because I'm in camera, but you know, if I have my arms crossed, I'm not making eye contact and I'm shaking my head, someone might perceive that, that I'm not interested in what they have to say, or I'm disengaged in the conversation. It could be that I'm really cold um, and I just got some bad news somewhere else and I'm responding to that, but I need to be aware of that. How am I showing up? So if I want to listen with my senses, I want to be able to make eye contact with the person, nod my head, um, do the hand gestures to let them know that, yeah, I am hearing and understanding. Tell me more, right? So those open-ended the, you know, hand gestures to let them know that, yeah, help me understand, tell me more. Um, so it's, un it's important to know that. That's why in this, when we're working virtually, use the camera, use the camera, use the camera, because it's the a wonderful way to try and get the communication. However, um, you still can't get true face-to-face -face because for instance, I'm looking at the camera right now. So I'm giving you eye contact. I'm making eye contact with you. However, if you have your camera on, I can't see your face because your picture is right over to the side of my screen. So if I wanted to look at your face to read your facial expressions, I have to look away. So now I'm not making eye contact with you anymore. So there's still limitations with having video and working virtually, but at least it's better than just doing the phone only. Because if your phone only, so you have no nonverbal things to look at, no facial expressions, no gestures, none of that, you just have tone of voice and words. But the research shows it's 86% of your message is delivered through your tone of voice. 86% of your message when you're on the phone only is that's how people are picking up your message. So I was recently working with a recent college graduate and um, it, it seems, and I don't have the scientific fact to prove this, but it seems like especially young men, but like between the ages of 16 and 24, I keep running into, they, they have this monotone tone of voice. So I was working with a young man recently and he's, he was, I really want to get this job. It's a really exciting job and it would be awesome to have this job. I hope I could get the job. And he's talking in this monotone voice. Like he wasn't any in fluctuation with the tone, no excitement, this, this even pace. And my coaching to him was like, you need to if you're doing these phone interviews, because he was trying to find a job during the pandemic and they were just doing phone interviews. I'm like, you need to let people know through your tone of voice that you want this job. Hey, this job sounds really exciting. I'm really looking forward to it. I was reading about the job. I was reading the job description online and it aligns with what I'm looking for and really use that tone of voice to get that excitement across and to get how your skill, how your skills match what they're looking for. It was interesting because he, he found a job. He was 
interested in. And the next time we met, he we were speaking on the phone and he was talking just like that. Oh my gosh, I found this really job and it sounds really interesting. It was a perfect alignment what I was doing. And he was talking fast. He was changing his tone of voice. He was, you know, a lot of in fluctuation. And I was like, this is exactly what you need to do when you talk to the recruiter. Talk exactly like this because that's what's going to help influence someone. So if you go in there like, yeah, it sounds like a really interesting job. I'd really like to do it. I went to school for that and I learned how to do that. They're not going to hear that excitement. So play around with this. Have fun. Listen to other people. Um, and also, if you want to have some fun, use your uh, hand gestures to help guide people. So for instance, I'm going to give you a little confession. As a facilitator, when I'm in a room with a group of people, if I would like just go like this, or go, I mean, I could actually control the audience with just my hand gestures. And if, if you are a religious person and you go to any type of religious event and you have the spiritual person, the pastor, the minister, the priest up in front, they will like guide the audience with their hand gestures. And it's, it's fun to see how people respond. So for example, if you scratch your head, watch people will start scratching their head. If you look this way, they'll look that way. Um, you start using your hands a lot the other people start using their hands a lot. So it's just sort of fun to see how people respond when you start using your nonverbal and your gesture and your um, eye contact and your facial expressions and, and see how people respond. So I, that's your homework is to play around with your nonverbal and your tone of voice and see how people respond. So these are the four components of emotional intelligence. And like I said, emotional intelligence can be developed. Uh, it's a skill that as we go through life and, and we hang out with people, we go through school, we go through work and we network with people, you start developing your emotional intelligence. It's, it's one of those, it can be developed and it just takes uh, focus effort. So here are some things you can do to help develop your emotional intelligence. It's first of all, just accept that you are going to have a wide range of emotions throughout the day. Um, and those are just thoughts. So, if, you know, something pops to your head of like, oh my gosh, I'm never going to get this job. You know, I don't know why you even apply for the job. Just stop and think and say, wait a minute, do I have any facts or data to support that? And why am I thinking that way? It's like, no, I have the skills to do this job. I had the experience and I'm going to go for it. So it's, it's not letting your mind take over because your ego mind would love to control you all day. And, but uh, um, there's a great book out there called Taming Your Gremlin. And Taming Your Gremlin was written by Richard Carlson. So it was written by Richard Carlson, C-A-R-L-S-O-N and Richard. And Taming Your Gremlin. It was written years ago. But it's one of those books you could read in like 15 minutes. And it's an awesome book because if you have that voice in your head that's, you know, you're never going to get the job. What are you doing that for? That's a stupid idea. You don't have the skills. Oh, don't try that. And, oh, you know, you can't do that anymore. That's your gremlin. That's a that's gremlin trying to eat away at your confidence or eat away at you getting in that growth mindset. And so what this book does is it helps you. How do you tame that gremlin? How do you calm that voice down to say, wait, I went to school for this. I really worked hard. I have the experience. And I think I, I could do this. So it's understanding that. I mean, to get in that learning loop. So it's understand that, accept them. And then being open-minded and curious. And with the open-minded is, is just paying attention to how people respond um, and learning from experiences. So if you do try something new or if you do go to that job interview, like what, what did I learn from that? What am I going to do differently? Um, and just knowing how you tend to react to things. There uh, was someone that... Um, I don't know what it was, but every time I worked with them, I would tend to get defensive. And, and you have to give people permission to get in your head. So it wasn't that person's fault. It was my fault. I was like, why am I like getting a defensive working with this person? And you know, was it words that they were using? Was it their behaviors? But it was all on me. And so I had to like, like, why am I doing this? But what I learned to do is like, whenever I would work with that person, I had a special bracelet I would wear and I would put that bracelet on my hand because that would keep me grounded in the moment. And it would keep my mind from running off going, oh, they're doing that because, or they just don't want me to. And, and I would like tell myself these stories that were like totally not true, but I would let my mind run, run away with it. So it's staying grounded in the moment, staying fully present and then fo and putting the emotions aside and say, what's really happening right now? Um, and what's my role in this, right? And, and you know, do I really know this for a fact? So it's paying attention, knowing how you tend to respond. And then you once you know how you respond, then you can go ahead and do that self-management. So it's listening, asking questions, challenge assumptions. So that's another thing is challenge assumptions and reflect. And you'll start um, 
I encourage you to start listening to people, especially people you admire, listen to them and see what type of words that they, uh, questions they tend to ask. Um, some of the favorite questions I like to ask are, help me understand. Because if I say, help me understand, who's going to say, no, I'm not going to help you. So help me understand. Tell me more. I'm confused. Uh, can you tell me more about that? I'm not sure if I heard you correctly. So it's putting ownership on me to find out more information. Um, I also like to ask questions of um, to help me learn and grow is, what am I doing that's helping you? What am I doing that's hindering you? And what do you wish I would do differently? So what am I doing that's helping you? What am I doing that's hindering you? And what do you wish I would do differently? So it's asking those questions to get information. So if you worked, uh, if you went for an internal job interview, so if you went to um, a job interview within the organization that you work at, so you, know, you work at company X and you're applying for a job in another department and you interview with that manager and you don't get the position, you could ask like, you know, what, what did I do that, that you felt added value to the interview or added value to the, you know, the job? And, and what do you think I should do differently or uh, in my next interview or what skills do you think I should develop? And to learn from that experience. Um, because when you do those internal job interviews, turn to those managers to be mentors, to help you prepare to develop skills or develop your interviewing, interviewing skills for the next time you apply for a position. And, and that's that emotional ag agility is just knowing that I need to do things differently um, because the way I was doing it's not working or let's try something new. Like I said, watch those nonverbal interactions. And my favorite is asking the loving critic uh, for feedback. So find what I call the board of directors, those people that you know are going to be honest with you and ask them to share with you. Like what, there again, what am I doing? It's helping what I'm doing. It's hindering. Um, and then have them call you out when needed. So for instance, if you tend to take over meetings or you tend to interrupt people or you tend to not listen um, or you don't ask questions, like if you're in the in the room with them, encourage them to like nudge you or click their pen or make give give you eye contact to keep you in check, right? Because you'll have people that you work with that you will give you they'll be honest, like they'll give you that honest feedback and that because they have your best interests in mind and they want to help you grow. And then you do the same thing for them, right? So you're helping each other grow um, because sometimes, you know, we, we get caught up in the moment and we're not paying attention to how we're showing up. That's that we lack that self-awareness and it's nice to have someone like sort of nudge us. Um, I had a, a great story on that to where I was supervising a team of people years ago when I was first became a supervisor. And I would get in this crazy hyper mode. Like when we got really busy, I would be like crazy um, because we have so much work to do. We got to get all this work done. And I would talk really fast. My hands would be flaring. I'd be telling everybody what to do. And my team members wanted to help, but I was in this crazy chaotic state that they didn't know what to do or say or how to handle it. But what was nice is someone finally, like they took me aside when all that had died down, like the next day and we sat down for a cup of coffee and they gave me feedback and they're like, you know what? We want to help you. Or, you know, I, they speak for themselves. I want to help you, um, but you get really crazy and, and it's hard to talk to you because you're just in this like barking out order mode um, and we don't know what to do. And you just like take charge and run with it. And if you tell us what to do, we'll, you know, we'll do it, but you just sort of do it yourself. And I had no idea that's how I was showing up. I had no idea that's how, how um, that, my behavior was impacting them. And so first of all, I apologize. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. And then I thanked the person for taking the time to give me feedback because she had no idea how I was going to respond because I was her boss. So she's like, is she going to yell at me? Is she going to like fire me? Like what's she going to do? But I'm so glad the person had the encouragement, the, the courage to give me that feedback. So she gave me that feedback. I thanked her. I was like, thank you so much. I checked in with a couple of my other employees and I said, do I tend to do this? And like, oh yeah, you do this. And I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. So I apologize to them too. And then I got the team together, together because I had realized that everyone was experiencing this. I got the team together. I apologized to the team and said, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize I get like this, but when I get stressed and there's a lot of work to do, I get this, I get this anxiety and I just get into this like crazy mode. And I'm, I'm sorry, I don't want to do that. Help me change. And so what we did is we came up with a code phrase and what they would say is when I got in that crazy mode, they would say, Janice has had too much cappuccino today. 
And when I would hear people say, Janice has had too much cappuccino today. Now people around us had no idea what was going on. They would just hear, oh, Janice has had too much cappuccino today. They wouldn't think anything of it. But as soon as I heard that Janice has had too much cappuccino today, I would stop, take a breath. Okay, okay, where am I at? What's going on? And how am I impacting the people around me? And I would get out of that limbic part, the emotional part of my brain, and get into that thinking part of my brain to be fully present in the moment. And then that helped me leverage the people that were on my team so we could collaborate and work together. They got to help out and it has helped me stay grounded. And they helped me grow as a supervisor. I mean, they helped me develop the skill of just being able to ground myself when I got into anxious, you know, got anxious. They helped me identify that. Um, and help me ground it. So now I don't need people to say Janice has had too much cappuccino because I've learned how to self-assess. I've learned how to catch myself before I get to that point. But it took me some time, but I was able to develop that. So reach out to people that you know and ask them to be that loving critic and then do the same for others. Also look at feedback that you've gotten over the years in other ways, any type of assessment you've taken. If you've taken an emotional intelligence assessment, any type of communication assessment, you've gotten your performance appraisals from previous managers, pull those out. So anytime you've gotten feedback from people or any type of assessment, take it out, lay them side by side and look at them and you'll, you might see some trends pop up and then you'll like to say, oh, okay. I tend to do this. I need to keep an eye on that. So that's a, a great way to look for those, any type of uh, assessment that you've done, look for that pattern. And then I like to say, build that board of directors. So the board of directors are those people that I just talked about that will, there's ones that will keep you in check, which I just shared. There's people that will build your confidence. So when you start to feel that you're, you're like, I don't know if I could do this. And oh my gosh, this is like totally out of my comfort level. They're going to encourage you. They're going to help you understand that, no, you could do this. So you have that person that's going to encourage you. The one's going to keep you in check. Yeah, that person's going to brag about you. Like they have a strong network across the organization or out in the community. And they're going to say, hey, did you know that Jance is working on XYZ or Jance is really good here? Or, and they're going to brag about you and they're going to build you up and, and help people see you from a different perspective. Um, so you have, board, you have your, um, there's like five or six ones. So you have your person that builds you up, person that will bring you back and keep you humble if you need to be humble because you're like, oh my gosh, I'm God's gift to the planet. I'm like, yeah, maybe not. Um, and then the other person is going to help build you up and then help network and uh, just encourage you. And then that, and that person is also going to help you think differently. So I had someone um, who I would think I had a, br a brilliant idea. I'm like, okay, here's, here's the idea. Here's the solution. Here's what I'm going to do. So I had this thought. But what I would always do is before I implemented this new idea, I would go to this one person and I'd say, here's what I'm thinking. And I'd share the idea with her. And I don't know how she did this, but she would ask me one question and she'd make me think totally different. And it was like mind blowing. I'm like, oh my gosh, I never thought about that. So I would come up with this solution that I thought was the best solution. Okay, I got it. It's going to work. This is what just what we need to do. I would always go to her and say, what do you think of this? I'd tell her what it is. And she'd say, well, what about da, 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 da? And I'm like, oh, I never thought about that. So I would always keep her in my board of directors because she helped me think differently. She helped me think from a different perspective. So build your board of directors because that's going to help keep you in that growth mindset. And then be on other people's board of directors. So it's a give and take, right? So if you're getting things from other people, you give to other people. You have your strengths. What are you good at? And how can you help mentor and coach other people to um, help them be their best? And the key is just focus on what you could control and influence. What are those things that um, are in your sense of control? And if you think about it, it's only you. Like don't, we can only control ourselves. We could control when we get up, when we go to bed, what we wear, what we eat, how we show up, the behaviors. Um, if anyone's tried to control their family member, their, sm their spouse, their peers, yeah, it doesn't work. We can't control other people. We could influence people. We can encourage people, influence people, but we can't control them. And then that circle of concern, that's that circle to where there's things that we're concerned about, but we can't do anything about it. And what you'll hear phrases of people that are in that circle of concern, it's like, 
oh, we've always done it that way. That will never work. Why are they doing that? They like to use the they. Like, why are they doing that? Why did they make that decision? It's too hot. It's too cold. You know, are we going to need a booster shot? Are we going to not need a booster shot? You know, the government doesn't know what they're doing. Blah, blah, blah. And they're like just constantly complaining and looking at the negative things. Um, instead of saying, wait a minute, what can I control and influence in the situation? Yeah, we don't have all the answers, but what part, what answers do we have? And what can I do to help find the answers or to help um, control harm showing up? So when you get people that are in that circle of concern where they're just always pointing the finger at someone else or something else, or it's always outside, just get them like, well, what can you do about it? Like, what can you control? What can you influence? What can you do about it? There's always something you could control and influence. You don't like your job? What are you going to do about it? Right? Like, what can you control? What can you influence? So it's always focus on that. It's going to bring people back to the reality. And then to stay in that continuous learning loop, it's focus on one or two behaviors at a time. It's interesting. I will ask people, what do you need to work on? Like, what's on your development plan? What skills do you need to develop? And people will immediately give me a long laundry list. I need to do this, 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 this. And they immediately list all these skills they need to develop. And I'll say, well, what's your strengths? Um, well, uh, and they don't know what their strengths are because they're spending too much time focusing on their weaknesses. It's like, no, first of all, know your strengths. Everybody has strengths. What are those? Know those, identify them. And then only focus on one or two things at a time and what's important right now, right? So like, I need to develop presentation skills because my job's requiring me to give presentations. I need to learn how to work with Excel because I need to start working on XYZ project. So it's what is the one or two things, focus on that and then find the resource, the mentor, the learning online, go to the library. The library has tons of information, right? Learn there um, and then develop that skill and then pick something else, but be very specific. So it's like, I need to learn Excel. Okay, but what specifically do you need to learn with Excel? I need to learn how to do pivot tables. Um, I need to learn, I need to develop my presentation skills. Okay, but what specifically do you need to do with, with your presentation skills? I need to learn how to design a PowerPoint presentation, or I need to learn how to you know, stand up in front of an audience. I need to learn how to use Zoom. So be very specific. So it was general, I need to, I need to improve my communication skills. It doesn't really, I mean, my gosh, communication skills is huge. It's like off the picture. Uh, what is it? Is it writing emails? If it's, is it choosing which um, mode of communication? Do you pick up the phone? Do you do an email? Do you do an instant message? There's so many different things you could do under improving your communication skills. So drill it down, be more specific, and then define what success looks like. Like what would it look like when you're doing this well? So when you start with the end in mind, so I need to, I need, you know, I need to um, start being very specific with the, and having good solid data, or I need to have, I need to have charts when I'm communicating because I know my audience prefers charts versus seeing the numbers. So I need to know how to make good charts. Um, and that's what success looks like is having a, a chart that, a picture that, says everything in a chart format. So that's what I want to learn. Okay, well, let's, you know, learn how to do pivot tables. You can turn them into charts. So it's, what's it end? What does success look like? And then, and then have small milestones to get there. So if you're getting your master's degree or going back to school or getting your undergrad degree, that's, that's, a, you know, that's a big chunk of time. So set smaller milestones. I'm first going to just take, go and register and sign up and get, you know, sign up for the class. Yay. Celebrate that. Okay. Now I'm going to take a course and get myself through one semester. Yay. Okay. Now I'm going to take two classes a semester and just do those smaller milestones because that's going to keep you motivated and engaged and mentor and be mentored. So there is research shows that those informal mentoring programs are much more successful than any type of formal mentoring programs. So I encourage you to network. This is where network, like LinkedIn, uh, talking to people, going to your library, talking to the librarians, um, seeing what programs they have, participating in the programs that the library has, and then networking with people before and after the event begins. That's so important. So if your library hosts an in-person event, 
you get there 15 minutes early and you talk to people in the room. Hi, my name is, and you know, why are you here? What, you know, why was this topic interesting to you? Ask questions, get to know them. Afterwards, talk to a couple of people. I really want to learn more about this. Do you know anyone that's really good at this? And you know, let people know, I want to learn more about this. I want to get into this. I'm looking to get into this field because everybody knows everybody. So the whole six degree of separation is, is real. So as someone knows someone, um, so talk to people, network. And then, like I said, leverage le uh, LinkedIn, you know, part, uh, just don't go to LinkedIn and look at what people post. Actually put your thoughts and comments under what people post. Create your own posts, join some of the LinkedIn groups because it's all about networking, finding other people, and then you could find mentors and they'll help you. And there's always something you could do to help someone else. So it's when you give, I think, I think giving is much more rewarding than, than getting. I've actually had mentors say that they've learned more. The mentor has learned more from their mentee than the, you know, that, you know, they feel they learned just as much as the mentee. So learning goes both ways when you're mentoring and when you're being mentored, you could, you could teach the person that you're, that you're mentoring. So be open to learning and mentoring. And then we have all these uh, resources that we have available for you as well. Um, and I know at the library, they have these books. The library also has um, probably magazine subscriptions. So I don't know if they have like Harvard Business Review or some of the different magazines that you could get. Um, Harvard, Bus Harvard Business Review does offer three free articles a month. So if you go to Harvard Business Review, um, you get three free articles a month. Um, so that helps you just, they have a ton of different topics. Just like, what are you, what are you looking at learning? Um, so for the apps, you have any type of app that just helps you just be centered, calm, and meditation's not this huge, complicated, oh my gosh, I have to, you know, hum and sit in the weird position and, you know, burn incense. It's just pausing, taking a deep breath, and being grounded in the moment, and just clearing your mind and focusing on your breathing, and just doing five minutes of that a day research shows you could actually rewire your brain and it will have a positive impact. So I encourage you to learn just when, when you start to feel your blood pressure go up or anxiety or start to feel stressed out, just pause, take a breath, center yourself, get present in the moment. What's going on right now is going to help you stay engaged. It's going to help you have um, positive interactions and stay in that thinking part of your brain. So these are some free apps that I put on there. Articles that you'll see, um, uh, Angela Duckworth, you know, I'm sure you heard about her. Um, that's a great, Sean Anchor, uh, if you go, he has a couple of videos out there as well. So with any of those authors, if you just put them in the search engine, they have articles, they have books, they have videos. So whatever form works best for you. Some people like podcasts, some people like videos, some people like articles, some people like hard copy articles, but you could find all that. There's different assessments you could take as well to help build that self-awareness piece of it. Your community college, maybe the library might offer them, but I know your community college definitely offers some, some different assessments so you can reach out to them. Um, and then you have uh, videos and websites. So on here, the centerforhealthyminds.org. That's uh, Richard Davidson, who's the, uh, he's a neuroscientist in the University of Wisconsin in Madison. He, Richard Davidson has written a ton of books and he's done it. And he's the one that has done the research where he actually has mapped out the brain and sees how your emotions are contagious. Highly recommend anything with him. And they have a website called Center for Healthy Minds and they have a lot of different articles and things you can participate in. So we recommend them. TED Talk, there's, a, it's really interesting. They took, you actually go to TED Talk and put in um, five TED Talks to increase your emotional intelligence. And they took all these emotional intelligence TED Talks and they put five of them together and they're, they're great. Um, and TED Talks are what, only 12, I think 12 to 15 minutes long. So they're already put together for you. I talked about Daniel Goleman and, but this is the focus flow and frazzle um, is really interesting. So it's like fighting that sweet spot between that, that chaos and bored. And that's when we're at our best. So that's a great thing to read. John Kabat-Zinn, uh, he has done a lot with stress management. So if you tend to be someone who's stressed out a lot, um, John there again, John Kabat-Zinn has a ton of books, articles, CDs, all that stuff. So if um, 
stress, anxiety, you know, the minds, your, your gremlin, is, your voices in the heads constantly telling you, you know, getting you all stressed out, anything from John Kabat-Zinn, and I talked about um, Richard Davidson already. And if you have any additional resources or things that you want to recommend, feel free to put them in the chat box. And like I said, I know your library has a ton of stuff. Um, I know my local library actually offers meditation classes. Like they have every Wednesday and Friday, uh, it's meditation with Haley and she's a phenomenal instructor. I'm in the Northern Illinois area and we go in there and there's like 10, 15 people and we all just meditate for an hour and then we leave and uh, it's awesome. So if you're, if the library doesn't offer it, you know, maybe let them know that you're interested and maybe that's something they could offer. So look at the calendar events. Jordan, I hope you don't mind that I'm advertising that for you <laughs> and other programs. So what I'd like to find out is, you know, what, you know, what questions do you have or make that commitment? What I really want to do is have you make that commitment. Like, what are you going to do differently to enhance your emotional intelligence? So what are you going to do to enhance your emotional intelligence? And what questions do you have? So it's picking that one to two things that you're going to do differently. And what questions do you have? Yeah, that just pausing and taking a breath. It's just, oh, it's amazing how just, and that works with kids and dogs. So my little nieces and nephews, when they were like three, four years old and they'd go into a meltdown, I would just get really close to them and I'd say, okay, let's take a breath. And I would just like, I would breathe right, you know, face to face. I would take five or six nice, strong, slow breaths and they would calm down. And my my niece's puppy, you know, Golden Retriever, got in that same frantic mode, how Golden Retriever puppies get really crazy. And I grabbed the dog and I'm like, okay, let's breathe. And I started breathing and the dog calmed down. So it works with pets too. So yeah, they're taking that breath. And it's interesting. It's it, If you notice, many times we're breathing shallow. So we're breathing from our chest. We're not breathing from our diaphragm. So for those of you on the call, what I'd like you to do is put your hand on your stomach. Take a nice deep breath in. And when you take the deep breath in, you want your diaphragm. You want your stomach area to expand out. So you, and your stomach area expands out. And then when you let the air out, you're pushing that stomach muscle, that diaphragm, you're pushing it in and you're expelling your air that way. So you're breathing in, taking it in through your nose. It goes all the way down into your belly. Sometimes they call it uh, baby belly breathing. So if you think how babies breathe, babies breathe with their belly. That's the way we should be breathing as adults. But for some reason, as adults, we tend to breathe from our chest. We, we breathe up here and we're doing shallow breathing. That's when we get anxiety. That's when we get nervous. That's when our voice cracks. That's when we're not projecting our voice. Um, if you've done any type of voice lessons or acting, it's because you're breathing from your diaphragm or do baby, we call baby belly, baby belly breathing. Say that 10 times so fast. So baby belly breathing, just breathe, expand the belly, exhale, and push that out. Thank you for bringing that up. So no questions. And Jordan, I don't know if there's any resources that you want to advertise that the library has. I hope I didn't put you on the spot by saying the, you, the meditation classes. <laughs> but are there any, any resources the library has that you want to advertise that align with developing emotional intelligence or you know being fully present and learning to breathe? Yeah, you know, here at the library, we offer a variety of workshops, of course, related to our career webinars, our business webinars, our technology ones, but we also have some related to some of our fun workshops, like crafty adults and writers workshops where people can um, relax. So I always try to find balance in my life. <laughs> yes. um, and so I always recommend all of them, you know, and every time someone's talking to us about professional development, sometimes I'll recommend the other workshops as well, or I'll talk about some of the um you know, the, the events hosted by our children's department, you know, in case they have families, things like that. But yeah, we have a variety of <laughs> resources. Excellent. You know, we have Ancestry.com if you're trying to go into ge genealogy as a hobby. We have LinkedIn Learning here at our library, which has Excellent. helped me yes. with a variety of um, professional development. 
Um, and not, not even just professional development, um, just life. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and of course, we have some of the books that um, you mentioned as well within our collection. So yeah, come see us and we could talk about all of the resources here at the library. Excellent. And I love the idea about doing like a creative class because that gets you thinking totally different. So if you're one of those folks that you tend to, you're really analytical, you're taking life really seriously and always look at the facts and data, push yourself out of the comfort zone and take a you know, a art class, because it's going to help you just expand your mind in a completely different way. And I guarantee you'll identify something you can bring back to the workplace. Yeah, we just started subscribing to a new resource called Creative Bug, which has um, videos and they have really fun PDF files where you can figure out, because I, I wouldn't, I'm not the craftiest person out there, but, you know, resources like that make it so easy for me to go to my local craft or hobby store. <laughs> Nice. and pick up the materials and take the courses on my own time you know and um so things like that we we have here at the library as well excellent excellent well thank you for the opportunity this is great and uh hopefully we'll be seeing people break down the door to come see you thank you janice All right. Well, thank you, Janice. This, once again, was wonderful. We appreciate your time.